Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the Public Health Webinar Series on Blood Disorders. This webinar is presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. I'm Dr. Rachel Rosofsky, and I'm a hematologist and clinical investigator at the Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. I'm also the director of thrombosis research in the Division of Hematology at MGH and co-chair of MGH Thrombosis Committee. I am thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Jeffrey Klein, who is a professor and associate chair of research at Wayne State University School of Medicine's Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Klein also serves as editor-in-chief of the journal Academic Emergency Medicine. We are both delighted to join you today to take a deeper look at the topic we each are extremely passionate about, venous thromboembolism and the psychosocial factors that affect the mental health of patients. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few points for joining the webinar. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour, and please note that this webinar is being recorded. All audio will be muted, and at the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions. To submit a written question, please use the questions area of your toolbox, and we will try to respond to as many as possible as time allows. We wanna begin with two brief polling audience, audience polls because we're interested in knowing more about you. So I'm gonna have these come up. This is the first one. Which of the following best describes you? And select one of them. Healthcare provider, public health professional, person with DVT or PE or family member, community-based organization or industry partner. Please submit now. So it looks like the majority of people are healthcare providers and we have 21 persons with DVT or family members and 21% is healthcare professionals. So really wonderful to have you joining us today. We have one more question. Oh, maybe not, just that's the only, oh yes, I thought so. What region of the world are you from? And please select one of these, North America, South America, Europe or Russia, Asia or Africa, or Australia or New Zealand. Please select which region of the world you are from. And it looks like the majority of people are from North America, but we have a smattering from other places around the world. So welcome. We really have a diverse group presenting and uh, showing up today. So I am thrilled to be talking to you today on this important topic. Here are my disclosures, all outside the scope of this talk. These are the learning objectives, and by the end of the webinar, we hope you're able to describe why patient-centered outcomes are important during VTE care, and describe how to use empathy to positively affect VTE patient care, and lastly, to list and always and never statement to make to a patient with newly diagnosed VTE. I'm gonna start with a case. This is a 26 year old female who presented with sudden onset right-sided pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. She thought she pulled a muscle and went to urgent care. A chest x-ray showed possible pneumonia and she was given a Z-pack and sent home. But two days later, she represented and this time to her primary care doctor complaining of a sore throat but ongoing right-sided pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. This time she was treated for presumed strep and sent home. However, the following day, the pleuritic chest pain worsened to the point where she presented to the emergency room. Her D-dimer was elevated and her CT scan showed, as you can see in this figure with the arrows, bilateral pulmonary emboli. She was started on anticoagulation. Just briefly to mention scope of the problem, we know based on data from the CDC that in the United States, every year, 900,000 men, women, and children are affected by venous thromboembolism, or VTE, every year, with 100,000 deaths. That means one person is dying of something related to VTE every six minutes. And this problem is not going away. As you can see here, the incidence of PE is on the rise. And there are many reasons for this. I'm going to highlight a few. 
One is active cancer, another one is uh, obesity, and pregnancy are to name a few. Why do we worry about pulmonary embolism? Well, it can be fatal within an hour after the onset of symptoms in 10% of cases, and untreated PE mortality can be as high as 30%. But PE is not just an acute illness. There's also something called post-PE syndrome, which is the long-term consequences after a pulmonary embolism, defined as limitations in cardiopulmonary function in combination with shortness of breath, reduced functional status, or reduced quality of life. Now these non-fatal consequences of PE can manifest as persistent dyspnea, persistent right ventricular dysfunction, and decreased quality of life. This uh, figure represents uh, work done by Susan Kahn where she looked at patients who suffered from a PE at one month and one year. And you can see here on this graph that almost 50% of patients still had exercise limitations after their pulmonary embolism at one year. What are the underlying causes for this? Well, they're varied. First, people can have pre-existing comorbidities like asthma, COPD, chronic heart failure, anemia. They can have functional impairment, deconditioned, pain, anxiety. They can have something called CTED, which stands for chronic thromboembolic disease. And this is a condition characterized by abnormal perfusion, but no resting pulmonary hypertension. And then there is CTEF, which stands for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And this is a condition where there's elevated blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries caused by these chronic clots, which obstructs the free flow of blood through the lungs. Now CTEF is probably the most morbid condition associated with PE, and you can see here the pictures of chronic clots. So what is the impact of post-PE syndrome on a patient's life? It can be significant and it can manifest as decreased quality of life, decreased functional status, increased depression, increased unemployment, increased healthcare costs, and as I already mentioned, increased mortality in patients with CTEF. So PE is not just an acute illness, there's post-PE syndrome. And then the impact of post-PE syndrome includes the psychological long-term consequences from PE. Well, what is the data behind this? There's actually very limited data in this area. And in fact, most of the studies that are done are qualitative studies. As you can see here, long-term psychological consequences of symptomatic PE, a qualitative study. Or this one, the lived experience with pulmonary embolism a qualitative study, or this one, coping with everyday life and physical activity in the aftermath of acute PE, qualitative study, or the long-term psychosocial impact of VTE, qualitative study. And this one, my whole life has changed, experiences of how symptoms derived from acute PE affect life, qualitative. So the studies on the psychological long-term consequences are limited, most have only a few patients. The ones I just shared were all less than 20 patients. There's a few others with um, 100, 200 patients, but most of them have very few patients. And like I said, most are qualitative. Now, one of the main themes in the qualitative studies is the concept of thromboneuroses. Patients can have physical reminders of their pulmonary embolism. For example, they have to take medications. And that can trigger emotional and psychological distress. Reminders, reminders that their PE was missed or they feel uncertain about their symptoms. And that can cause pain, uh, panic, anxiety, anger. And that leads to hypervigilance of any physical sensation, like a pain in the leg. And that, that, then that re-triggers the emotional and psychological distress again. And it becomes a cycle, as you can see here. Now, our patient, her symptoms were ignored and she was misdiagnosed. This is unfortunately not unusual. A recent study showed that the pooled rate from three different studies of misdiagnosis of PE in the emergency room was 28%. So, so far I've been talking about qualitative studies and I do wanna share a quantitative one. There's only a few of them and they're mostly focused on quality of life and they either use generic quality of life questionnaires or the PE specific quality of life questionnaire, but by itself. Now, in the quality of life questionnaires, there are some questions about anxiety and depression. For example, in this study, this was evaluating health-related quality of life using a generic quality of life questionnaire. 
it was 213 patients with a history of PE, and they were compared to controls, the general population, and also something called buddy controls, which were age and sex matched friends or relatives who did not have blood clots. And the authors found, as you can see from this graph, that the PE patients, and that is the blue boxes, reported more problems in all aspects of health-related quality of life compared with the controls and the buddy controls. This was in terms of mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, and anxiety and depression. Again, this was one survey, general quality of life, and one part on anxiety and depression. There are others, but again, limited in what they measure. So we know there's limited data. What about guidance documents? What do the guidelines tell us on how to think about and investigate the emotional and psychological aspects after VTE? Well, similar to there being limited data, there's also limited guidance. You can see here in the 2019 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the diagnosis and management of acute PE. They do mention have a follow-up at three to six months, but nothing that addresses these important long-term consequences and components. If you look at the CHESS guidelines, if you look at our own pulmonary embolus response team consortium guidelines, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society of Hematology guidelines, nothing about investigating the functional status, psychological impact, or quality of life. Now, the European guidelines did come up with uh, optimal follow-up after acute PE last year, and they do remark at the three-month mark to consider and talk about post-PE syndrome and consider psychological support for patients with incomplete functional recovery due to anxiety or depression. Clearly, there are large gaps in this area, and we need to do better. Well, how can we do that? One, we need to start asking our patients about this, and two, we need to incorporate these outcomes into our clinical trials. Well, let's start by asking our questions. Everything I just shared with you is the rationale behind the CLUES study. CLUES stands for Critical Look at Understanding the Emotional Suffering of Blood Clot Survivors. And I partnered with the National Blood Clot Alliance, NBCA, a patient advocacy group on this study. Now over 3 million people visit the NBCA website yearly. So what better place to house a questionnaire about life after VTE? Now the aim of this was to evaluate features of post-VTE syndromes and their impact on the functional outcomes and quality of life. We used 12 validated instruments, never mind me, 12, everything I've just mentioned has mentioned one or two, 12 valid instruments focusing on several determinants of well-being that play important roles in recovery after VTE. And they were included in an anonymous survey at exploring patient relevant outcomes after VTE. We placed it on the website of the National Blood Cut Alliance and online via Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Here are the list of surveys we used. Now remember, these are all quantitative surveys and we had 12 of them. And I wanna point out that this collection focuses on all aspects of post PE and deep vein thrombosis or DVT issues, not just one survey. It is a gold mine. Now I'm not sure if anyone in the audience does survey work. I know Jeff does. And I did a survey during COVID where we looked at prophylactic anticoagulation patterns uh, that providers were, um, were using to prevent blood clots. And we sent this to several organizations around the world. And we were so excited when 514 people took the survey. When we opened this survey up on the NBCA website, in the first hour, over 650 people took this survey. And this response speaks to how important this issue is to our patients. And before I go on, I wanna thank all the patients that took it. We have 21% of patients on the, on the webinar right now or family members. We need and want to learn from you. I'd like to share some of what we found. So in total, we had 3,372 participants of which 86% were women. Now we did ask people, how long ago did, was your most recent blood clot? More than 50%, it was more than a year ago. And over 80%, it was more than three months ago. So really looking at those kind of longer term consequences. We then asked, how well do you understand the medical condition of having a blood clot? And you can see here, over 90% of people 
had sometimes a lot or complete understanding. And at first we were a little bit perplexed and then we realized this is on the NBCA website, which is a website full of information for patients and providers. And so of course, it kind of makes sense that 90% would have a good understanding. What surprised us is what I'm gonna share with you in the next slide. Over 50% of people after their blood clot were still experiencing moderate or severe anxiety. And over 50% had moderate or extreme pain. And almost 50% of people still had problems with performing their usual activities and needing help with that. And I also wanna share that over 75% of patients had some form of ongoing uh, post-thrombotic stress syndrome, which is remarkable. Now, of course, there's some selection bias here. Obviously, the people that took the survey want to share their, their, um, uh, their concerns and results and feelings. However, this is the largest collection of quantitative surveys investigating the frequency and degree of dyspnea, pain, anxiety, depression, and PTSD in patients diagnosed with VTE and their impact on functional outcomes and health-related quality of life. I shared some preliminary data. We've asked some important questions, and we have now ongoing analyses, and we're gonna be able to use this data to really explore all sorts of questions we have. First, we're gonna look at descriptive analyses, but then we're gonna look at association patterns. How do the measured outcomes relate to one another? There are gonna be endless questions, and we are so excited to delve into this. So be on the lookout. The information collected and the analyses generated from these surveys are gonna provide a greater understanding of these important issues and are really gonna help the VTE world guide future patient care, education, and research. So we need to ask our patients. We also need to incorporate these outcomes into our clinical trials. And I wanna highlight two avenues for this to potentially occur. The first one is a multidisciplinary project we started in collaboration with the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measures in 2021 to establish a full overview of important outcomes of VTE care. Now, the aim of the project was to develop a set of patient-centered outcome measures for patients with VTE that would cover all the important aspects of VTE care, including those that mattered most to patients. We convened an international multidisciplinary working group of patients, physicians, advanced practitioners, nurses, and researchers. We performed an extensive literature search, we met in focus groups, and using a modified Delphi process, we developed a core set of outcomes of VT care. And these recommended outcomes are shown in this figure, and they involve the traditional outcomes, survival, bleeding, recurrence, economic outcomes, but I wanna focus on the patient-centered outcomes that are highlighted with these yellow stars. Quality of life, symptom burden, functional outcomes, psychological aspects, covering the perspectives of healthcare professionals, society, and patients. And the goal of our project was really to standardize and improve the care of patients with VTE. We wanted to facilitate a standardization of outcomes to make meaningful comparisons across institutions and countries. But really, we wanted to empower patients to manage their disease and seek optimal care focused on their individual needs. I encourage providers on the call to ask their patients about these important questions. I encourage researchers to include them in any clinical trial involving outcomes of VTE, and I encourage patients if your providers are not asking you these questions, please bring them up on your own. The second place we wanna make a difference is through pulmon PERC or Pulmonary Embolism Research Collaborative. This is a first of its kind collaboration with physicians, patient representatives, advocacy groups, healthcare organizations, industry leaders, and the US Food and Drug Administration with the goal of advancing the care for patients with PE. So this initiative was developed uh, by the National Pulmonary Embolism Research Team, PERT Consortium, where we brought together an international group of multidisciplinary experts to really explore the gaps in recognizing, diagnosing, and treating patients with acute PE. And the aim of this, similar to ITEM, is really to define and standardize information that's collected and analyzed for PE patients to really develop a comprehensive compendium of data elements that would really allow for the complete evaluation of how a patient is treated. And the ultimate goal is to inform and improve 
future PE care. So importantly, two of the 10 working groups of PERC and a major component that came out of this group was focused on patient-centered outcomes and the incorporation of the iChem data. I think this is amazing. Leaders and experts in VTE from all over the world are saying this is important. Patient-centered outcomes are important and we need to include them in all aspects of patient care. So how can you get involved? Well, one, you're attending this webinar, which is amazing. Two, October 13th is World Thrombosis Day, right around the corner. And this is your opportunity to raise awareness about VTE, share this webinar, give a lecture on VTE, have an information booth at your hospital. Go to the World Thrombosis, uh, World Thrombosis Day website, go to NBCA website, go to the PERT Consortium website. You can go there for many ideas and you wanna celebrate this day. And importantly, don't wait until tomorrow. Open your eyes to thrombosis today. More specifically, what can we offer our patients? And this comes from Simon Noble's work. Be cognizant of the signs and symptoms of psychological stress in your patients after a VTE. Listen to your patients. Ask specific questions about patient-centered outcomes. Acknowledge that this is not unusual and they're not alone in this. Explain that there are resources and support systems that patients can take advantage of. I want to end with this graphic illustration that we developed to show the path of outcomes for VTE once patients survive. Obviously, we need to focus on preventing recurrent VTE, bleeding, post-thrombotic syndrome, the post-PE syndrome I mentioned. But we also, and what I've been discussing for the last 15 minutes, we also need to recognize and treat these patient-centered outcomes, quality of life, functional abilities, symptoms, the psychosocial aspects, depression, anxiety, PTSD. We've heard from you, our patients, that this is important and we need to address them. Of course, the societal level outcomes are very important. Maybe that's for another webinar. So my closing reflections are the psychosocial impact after PE is underappreciated and understudied. Clues study gave patients a voice. We can use this data to help guide patient care and research, and we need to include these outcomes in clinical trials. And I wanna thank our patients again, and thank you to the NBCA for this and all the other work being done centered on patients. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Dr. Klein. Thank you, Dr. Rosofsky. I appreciate the introduction and I'll remind everyone that I'm bringing the lens of an emergency physician. So I'm gonna talk about the tip of the spear in terms of the um, medical system. Most people with pulmonary emboli are diagnosed in the emergency department and the actions and the words that happen by all healthcare providers in the emergency department setting can profoundly affect the long-term psychosocial consequences. And as uh, Dr. Rosowski mentioned in her case, frequently uh, we miss it. Uh, pulmonary embolism, you know, maybe it's 28%, maybe it's higher, we don't know for sure, but a substantial fraction probably of the folks in this audience recognize that it took a few touches with healthcare to uh, be able to be fortunate enough to be diagnosed. So I am uh, advancing, I'll just say advanced slide. <clears throat> I wanna focus on the red arrows here because that's really where the ED, the emergency department becomes important, but most patients arrive by private vehicle or sometimes ambulance to the emergency department where diagnosis may or may not happen. And then they get admitted to the hospital. So right there, that first red arrow, there are some key actions and words that can affect everything that's downstream to the right. Um, but many patients go home, they continue to have symptoms. And uh, I sort of say partially sarcastically, if they get near an emergency department after being diagnosed with PE, they're gonna get tested again for PE and undergo uh, frequent uh, low value CT scans. And uh, that can contribute to the overall sort of perception of wellness that they keep getting investigated yeah, whether or not they're on anticoagulation. And you can see that there's going to be a cycle of coming to the ED, maybe getting admitted, maybe being discharged home, bouncing back and coming back to the emergency department. 
And next slide, please. So I like this phrase. I've never met Helen Haskell, but I've used her words. And the diagnosis is born in a relationship and forms the basis for everything that happens in healthcare. And part of what I'm talking about is informed to some extent by doing work in medical malpractice and understanding the allegations of negligence and what comprises those. What are, what are the patients wanting when they're looking for accountability with medical legal actions? And that's uh, underlying kind of the elephant in the room of what I'm talking about today. Next slide. I think it was about 10 years ago that we started seeing specific literature that addressed the psychosocial manifestations. I, I remember this paper came out in thrombosis research. I think it's a Danish group, but they basically showed that patients that were diagnosed with pulmonary embolism were far more likely to end up taking anti-anxiety medications, neuroleptic drugs, um, even antipsychotic drugs. So the psychosocial component uh, is probably more complex even than the physical component. And I, I think that this is a question that um, Dr. Rosofsky and I, we, we talk about when we're at meetings is whether or not there's something specific and unique about pulmonary embolism, because certainly individuals that have had stroke and myocardial infarction and cancer or even severe trauma sustain some degree of PTSD and long lasting anxiety but there's just not enough study to even, for example, do some type of comparison to understand if PE is just like other thrombotic conditions, like arterial thromboses, like I was just said in the brain or, or heart, or whether it's more of a hybrid of the concern that you have to take long-term anticoagulants, which can lead to um, unpleasant bleeding or even dangerous bleeding, or whether it's the fear of recurrence, which may be greater, the fear may be greater in PE. We just don't know for sure about comparison to other diseases. Next slide, please. And so when the patient comes to the emergency department, if we have any ER docs on the call, I always try to teach this to my residents. They don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And uh, this really is the starting point right after that Helen Haskell statement about a relationship forms everything that happens thereafter. Next slide, please. Uh, one slide up, please. Empathy is in the middle of everything. It's not necessarily about being kind and compassionate and nice. It's really about listening and hearing and understanding. But if you don't do that, then it's very difficult to link trust and satisfaction, adherence to medication, and in the belief that you're competent and compassionate. It has to start with the ability to understand the patient's point of view. There's really two parts to empathy, cognitive empathy, which is really taking a good history. It's listening and getting your own attention and listening to what the patient is saying and saying it back to them. I always like to say, what was going through your mind when you decided you needed to come to the emergency department today? I mean, nobody wants to come to the ER. Nobody wants to be here. What was happening? That's the basis of cognitive empathy. Affective empathy is more understanding what the patient is feeling, what their emotions are, how they're reacting to their symptoms. Next slide. But this is really an important part of empathy, which is Gestalt processing. Gestalt technically is the, the sum of the parts. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's how we think it's a German word that basically means figuring things out inside your head. And if we don't have proper gestalt processing, we're not going to put pulmonary embolism high on the differential diagnosis and do the testing that's necessary. What is gestalt? Uh, well, these are five components that I've made up and published. I don't know that I'm right about this, but uh, these are what I think they are. And they start with fact knowledge from training, med school and residency, move to the top. What do other people do? Um, we in medicine don't like to deviate. Uh, you like to be uh, similar to what your colleagues do, even if sometimes you don't necessarily agree with it, normative behavior is a big part of medicine. The, the visual processing part on the right is extremely interesting in terms of how we interpret patients' faces, their muscle tone, their overall appearance, sick, not sick. And then down below, patient data 
their vital signs. And these can lead to problems of this cognitive biases of framing and anchoring where we get to the wrong conclusion about whether or not PE needs to be worked up. So those two things are areas of research to understand how doctors process visual information and what they use that drives them to either have false positive or false negatives, meaning failure to test is the false negative when the patient has the disease, as in Rachel's case. And then prior experience or pattern recognition, it's uh, something that just comes with experience. Um, next slide, please. I can say for sure that empathy failure is intertwined with allegations of negligence. This is a quote from a deposition of a father who was in the room with his daughter who had, turns out, had pulmonary embolism and there, uh, there was the, the diagnosis was not made and, and she unfortunately died of sudden death two days later. But this quote is what we want to avoid. She was just sitting there hyperventilating, that's the patient. He, the doctor, just kind of walked in and said, you need to calm down. He was writing in his chart and talking to the nurse about getting a breathing treatment. He never really looked at her. Whether or not that's true, that's the perception of some family members and that is an empathy failure. Next slide. And uh, so I want to talk a, a minute, and again, uh, Dr. Rosowski mentioned qualitative interviews, but we became interested in whether we could actually teach empathy to emergency physicians. Now, there's other methods out there, one of them by uh, Helen Reese, and uh, she uses a mnemonic empathy, and uh, that includes eye contact and motor tone and other parts of the of empathy. But um, there wasn't anything specific for emergency medicine. So we went and undertook a, a national survey of patients undergoing testing for PE, and then we did some focus groups. So if we could just run this video, please. Um, I wanna follow up on this topic of, of trust because David brought it up a little bit, Monique brought it up a little bit. I'm interested in what doctors do, what they say, what what they don't say, how they look, how they act. What what does a doctor do that helps earn your trust? What can they do to help you trust them? Or have they done that helps you trust them? Explain. They come in with a happy face. Okay. Why does that help you trust them? Uh, like a good example, because mm -hmm. I've had, a, I'm not going to lie, I've had a lot of bad experience. Yeah. I guess because I've been going every, t every day almost of the year I was going. I didn't care because I knew something was wrong. Yeah. And I guess it kind of irritated them. But I also, with the good ones that I, like I say, Dr. Barber, one in that Chinese lady, I wish I knew her name, so I stopped. But uh, when they walk in the room, they be like, how you doing, Miss Lewis? And I'm like, how are you doing? I'm doing great today. How is your day? Some walk in there just miserable, like they mad at the world, and it's like, Maybe I need to go and come back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, back to the slides. So we did these focus groups with patients and all of these patients signed uh, permission for me to use their video and use their words and, and show them. And we did these focus groups across the United States with a wide variety of individuals. And what we were putting together was these qualitative methods where you then transcribe everything and two investigators go through and look at the components of what the patients taught us. And um, I wanted to create something that was a learning tool using something called the cognitive approach to teaching. So we developed the map, next slide. One slide up there. We developed this uh, thing we call the empathy circle, and uh, each of these components came out of what the patient, patients told us. Um, this was pre-COVID. I think COVID sort of uh, made people quit shaking hands or touching patients in the emergency department setting, but uh, patients continually told us, consistently told us that physical touch matters. They really appreciate if we can come in and know something about their past history, and they that that we're there, we're, we're present in the time and not that part of just writing in the chart and never even looking at the patient. Sitting down has always mattered for empathy. I'm not in a hurry. Looking at and commenting on the patient's face, like you look like you don't feel good. Even something that simple can build empathy in a very fast way. 
and then explaining what I'm going to do, what are the tests, and what are the benefits and the risks of doing, for example, a CT scan for pulmonary embolism, which isn't a free ride. There are some small risks. There are some unknown risks in terms of lifetime cancer. And use explanation to alleviate anxiety. This is this whole idea of reassurance, cognitive reassurance, and especially in the case of if you do diagnose pulmonary embolism, or if, if, if pulmonary embolism is diagnosed, then understanding that patients are partners, they're not problems, and to work with them so that they understand what's going to happen at least in the next couple of days. Next slide. Now, empathy's hard to teach. I just wanted to show the results of a, of a multi-center study that we did, and uh, we used that cognitive map, that empathy circle. We trained doctors at four, at three institutions, how to use it, and at others we used this control. Down at the bottom, you'll see T1 con, T1 intervention. The intervention were the group that got the cognitive map. The, these are two scores. One is the Jefferson scale of patient perceived physician empathy, lots of P's there. The other one is the trust and physician scale. And these are questionnaires that we gave to patients at the end of their ED visit who were cared for by about 120 physicians in the control group and about 110 in the intervention group. And we made some small changes in the JSPPE. You can see that it doesn't look dramatically different because most of most docs had pretty good empathy scores to start with. And But over on the right, the trust and physician score, we did move the needle a little bit on that and showed uh, somewhat of an improvement using this cognitive empathy. But the point of this is there, that empathy, it's, it's difficult to move the needle. Um, first of all, doctors have to want to change. Some of them think they're fine and they may not be perceived as fine by their patients, but uh, this is you know, a part about being open. And one thing I've learned from this research is that the, the, the doctors who already scored high were the ones likely to score higher, you know, they just because they were interested to start with. And the ones that scored low, they really did not score that, they did not score much better. Next slide. <clears throat> but after diagnosis happens, the first thing, of course, is hallelujah. But then miscommunication be can become manifest. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the last 20 years of doing research in pulmonary embolism, and this is in terms of two tr clinical trials called Topcoat and INO referenced below, 74% of patients at the time we attempted to get their informed consent could not say what they had as a diagnosis. Three quarters did not know the name of their diagnosis. Um, and that gives credit, like if they just said, the doc says I has clots in my lung, they got credit for that. But many times the patient doesn't even know that they have, why they're getting put on heparin and they don't even know the name of their condition. Uh, only 4% could tell us what in general they were going to receive, such as uh, something to to thin their blood, which I don't like that term, but uh, and, and nothing that really could they could tell us about anticoagulation. In experience, uh, we know this that patients receive vague and conflicting and and sometimes wrong information. So I want to give some examples of what we say that can have long-lasting uh, psychosocial impact. Next slide. And this required a mixed methods approach. So this is Dr. Jacqueline Hernandez who did this work in my laboratory at, in, at uh, Indiana, and she conducted purposive qualitative interviews to elicit the potential for lasting patient experiences based on what happened to them at the time of diagnosis. And most of these patients were more than a year out, like the folks that um, contributed to the CLUES study. So the, they, they, had, they still remembered even though it was more than a year ago. Next slide. And what they told us, is here in the bold. I meant there were a lot of doctors coming in there and they, they told me usually somebody in your situation would be on a respirator and he can barely breathe on his own. And I'm like, well, you guys are supposed to be helping me, but you're scaring me. Direct quotes from patients. It was unnerving. I was so dangerous 10 minutes ago. I wasn't allowed to walk to the restroom by myself, but now I'm healthy enough that I can go home. Now, miscommunication or over communication perhaps about how, how fatal this condition might be. I don't think it helps to tell patients that. It helps to tell them that we got this. Um, next one, because for somebody to stand over you and tell you, you've got to have this surgery. If not, you're going to die. And then the final bullet, um, 
except he said, you have a saddle. And I thought, what is that? You know, the use, use of jargon. And so I really, I didn't really, there really wasn't an opportunity just to sit down and have a conversation with anybody. Um, that's really part of the empathy, part of the sitting down and, and treating patients like partners. Next slide. And so suggested statements for, for clinicians are always, once PE is diagnosed, there's, there's no benefit to telling people they're ticking time bombs or that they almost died. I mean, that's sort of self-aggrandizing to even say that, but instead to say, we got this, we have the ability to treat your condition. You don't necessarily have to say prognosis. I would say you have a very good prognosis because 90% of people with PE do fairly well. And I think it's reasonable to say most patients like you do well. If the patient is really sick and in shock, you're probably not gonna say these things, but most patients are, are hemodynamically stable. But never, you are a ticking time bomb and never, you are lucky we diagnosed this. These are the always and never statements that I believe can be supported by qualitative research. Next slide. And lastly, my summary is that empathy is an understanding of what the patient is saying about their perception of need for the emergency visit. Why did you come here today? Empathy failure associates with and may contribute to failure to diagnose pulmonary embolism and other emergent conditions. And at the time of diagnosis of PE, provider statements about risk should be carefully considered. And that ends my portion of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Klein. It really just your work is phenomenal and I think we can all learn so much of it. I've heard you speak, I don't know, <laughs> dozens of times and I always learn something from you. So we are going to shift to the question and answer section of our webinar. And again, in the uh, question and answer, if you uh, are an audience, you can submit questions um, using the questions area on your toolbar. Uh, so to start with one, um, one uh, somebody asked, um, I think the largest concern that I've had after my PE was recurrence. And, Je and Dr. Klein, uh, let me ask you, are there ways that providers can reassure patients in the recovery about the likelihood of recurrence? And I'll have you answer first and then I'll, I'll chime in with what I think. But what would what are, what could providers do to really um, I mean you you shared you know always and never statements but they're home uh, or right before they go home or when they come back for their follow up but what can providers what kind of reassurance can providers give patients? I think first that the the most important thing that a patient can do to prevent or reduce their recurrence rate of course is to take their medicine. Um, I ran clock clinic for many years and I had a fellow who was a very, very funny guy. And he said, you know what you need to say is, is everything is take your pill. Don't not take your pill. And that was the most <laughs> important thing that we could say, but still 8% of patients don't fill their prescription. And the reasons they don't fill their prescription in the first month are, are multiple, including insurance and including the perceived, the perception that they don't need this medication. The latter part we can deal with. I mean, we can talk about that. The former part in terms of finances, uh, it's all I can say is it's important to ask. Sometimes we have to use warfarin because the patient can't afford the copay or they don't have any insurance and they're having to pay out of pocket for a, 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 an anti 10A mm -hmm. oral mm -hmm. anti 10A agent. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, reassuring patients, if, if you're taking your anticoagulant, your chance of getting another blood clot is exceedingly low. And so I think giving that message to patients is so important. And I also think um, when I first started, um, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, I didn't really ask patients, how much are you paying for your drug? But it's actually one of the, I always ask patients the first, uh, you know, each visit, uh, but really ask because sometimes patients are reluctant to tell you that they can't afford it or they don't want to bring that up. And so I say to patients, how much are you paying for this? And then we talk about it, you know, if this is a, if this is a, a burden, how we can deal with that. I will say that um, we have a prior authorization nurse at our institution. I'm fortunate enough to have one. And pretty much, you know, the majority of her job is to, is to do prior authorizations. I will say some of the drug companies have, um, have programs that can help people. And you know, in a few years, some of these will become generic. So that's gonna be um, very helpful too. But this can be a real burden. And I think it's important for providers to definitely do that. I think in terms of the 
taking it and then reminding people to take it. You know, they've done studies, and I'm sure I know you're aware of these, uh, is that if you watch, if you follow people over time, that over time there's a percentage every, you know, six months, one year, two years, if people need to be on this long term, where there's a drop off where people stop taking it. And so I think the importance of follow up and the importance of really making sure that patients are taking them and then to explore the reasons why they might not be taking them and that they're taking it correctly. Uh, that, you know, it's a once a day, it's a twice a day, it needs to be taken with food, things like that. And so I, I think that's also really important. Um, there was another question. There was a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you want to add? Please do. I, sometimes the details can really make a difference. Like if someone's taking rivaroxaban to make sure they know they to take it with food, um, that can really affect the absorption. Um, the other thing, just a small detail, but some people like to understand this little thing. If you're taking rivaroxaban, you take the twice a day part for 21 days, and the pill's kind of a big oval pill. And then when they switch to the once a day, it's a little triangle, and it's actually smaller than the two oval pills. And some patients think they're not getting enough medicine. So just to sort of give that simple reassurance is just an example of how you can make, you can just alleviate a little bit of anxiety with just a few words of knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think for providers, if you are not uh, used to prescribing this medication, they're all different, right? They have different lead-ins. One is twice a day and then goes to once a day. Another one, you know, for 21 days, another one, seven days. So I think it's important if it's not something that you always prescribe to to look up how to how to prescribe them. Because there was a study out of um, the Riate Registry, which is out of Spain, patients that were not on the right uh, regiment um, had a tenfold higher risk of recurrence. So I think that that is very, very important. Um, I just want to, uh, someone uh, said this lecture really highlights how a pharmacist RN anticoagulation clinic can help with adherence and side effects. Oh my gosh, yes, I could not agree with you more. We're fortunate enough to have an anticoagulation management service uh, at our institution. And I think the role of pharmacy um, and uh, RNs are, are just, could be incredibly helpful. Uh, Dr. Klein, tell me, is that something you have at your institution? And what would you tell people who are thinking about, oh, maybe I want to start one of these? Well, I ran two clock clinics and one was run by nurse practitioners and the other one was run by pharmacists. And um, so this is my favorite pharmacy story. If when a patient would come in and they said that they had problems getting the medicine at a pharmacy, I, I don't know, these people have superpowers. They would pick up the phone and they would have the pharmacist on the phone in like 30 seconds and they would be speaking special pharmacy talk and then they would just literally come back in and say go back to the pharmacy and you're going to get your medicine now they just have this ability to coordinate and understand pre-authorizations and get patients um, the medicine that they need um, I, I, I think they have they're they, they're like superheroes to me yeah and I would say there's a wonderful organization, the Anticoagulation Forum, and they have a whole, so Allison, Dr. Allison Burnett, pharmacist, uh, and the whole Anticoagulation Forum, uh, um, Forum has developed a whole Anticoagulation Management Stewardship Program, and I encourage you to go to that website uh, and learn more about it. And I, again, it's a vital piece to all of this. So whoever wrote that, thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, the next question is, how do we get providers on board with a psychosocial approach to care? Excellent question, thank you. And first of all, get them to see this webinar. And actually somebody did say that this, uh, um, how do I get um, a hold of this webinar and even share it on October 13th? I think that's an amazing and wonderful idea. So this is certainly something that you could share with your institutions on October 13th, air this webinar is a great idea and it will be on the CDC website. So you will be able to access it. So Dr. Klein, tell me about um, how, what's the approach um, that you could use if somebody uh, needs, you know, how do we get providers on board who may not be thinking about these issues like you and I do? Yeah. Wow, that's <laughs> going to require re-education. <laughs> and you have one minute. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the idea of, of empathy and understanding the patient's perspective is has really taken on new power in the last 10 years. Um, the relatively new School of Medicine uh, at TCU in um, in, uh, um, in near Dallas is 
basically focusing its uniqueness of its medical school on the whole concept of empathy, just as one example. So I think it's getting taught now, and we now have it in evaluations for residents where we didn't have it before. There used to just be this box, does the patient have human, or does the doctor have humanistic qualities that are good or not? And that was it. Now we have whole bro broken out sections about how the, the, the physicians and training learn to have these empathic skills. So it's not gonna happen overnight, but it, it is happening. And mm -hmm. uh, with patient satisfaction being such an important part of really even our our bonuses, our reimbursement, um, I think we're gonna have to do it. Yeah, and I would, you know, 21% of people on this webinar are either patients or providers. And I would encourage patients, if your providers are not bringing these things up, that you bring them up yourselves. It's so important. And um, we've had an incredible um, chat and questions and people sharing their stories in the chat. Some people saying that they feel really helpless. I would say, you know, definitely you can get hold of this webinar, somebody asked. And also just, there's a ton of material on the National Blood Clot Alliance website. And we've actually done several webinars looking at the psychosocial components and we've had patients, I've been on those. So there's a lot of webinars on that website that specifically address this issue. So, so um, that's another resource for you. And I would just keep asking until you find somebody that's gonna listen to you. I think that's really important. I had a patient who uh, passed out and she woke up in the emergency, she woke up in an ambulance and she had a, a pretty significant PE. And for the next year, every time she heard an ambulance, she ended up having crushing chest pain, went to the emergency room every time, I think had six or seven CAT scans by the time she saw me. And I said, I think you're having panic attacks. So I set her up with someone uh, who's a cognitive behavioral th therapist and she can now listen to an ambulance and not freak out. So I really think we have to ask these to our patients and the patients, if your providers are not listening to you, please reach out and, and keep asking somebody until you get somebody to listen, really. Um, I also, oh, did you wanna say anything else, Jeff? Dr. Fine. Fine. I, just in terms of health equity, I think we both and, and most of the researchers that in this area agree that we don't have enough information about socioeconomic status, about racial differences. I, I would dare say that most qualitative studies have been done with folks that are relatively adherent, interested in their health, um, don't necessarily have all of the, uh, they don't necessarily have chaotic home settings. So we really need to know more about the interplay between socioeconomic status and the post-PD syndrome. Um, I, it, this is not just a problem of affluent individuals. This is a problem for, it's probably even greater, but we just don't know. We don't have any, any really good data to know how it affects across the spectrum of our patients. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Khan, I'm so glad you brought that up because we do know that there are great disparities in outcomes. So there was a study done by a good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Carlin Martin, looking at the racial disparities and they found that black men and women had a twofold higher rate of um, mortality related to their PE or P or, or due to their PE or PE related mortality. And I think you're exactly right. We don't, no one's really investigated how these longer term outcomes, um, what the disparities are in there, but we already know these disparities exist. And so I think we as a medical community need to really address those and uh, and combat them. So I'm so, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's, that's very important. Um, we had another question and uh, somebody uh, just going back to the direct all anticoagulants and just so um, there are 21% patients on this um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, some of them say, um, to take them twice a day. What do you tell patients about twice a day? Does, they, does it have to be 12 hours apart or can they just do, you know, twice a day whenever? Yeah, I think that <laughs> um, don't play catch up. Don't take, <laughs> don't take two if you forgot in the morning. Um, but I, you know, it's, you do get the, an end of, you know, you start to get under the therapeutic uh, anti-10A range at about 12 hours. So I, I'd probably rather them take it early than late. Uh, so if it's 10 hours and you're getting ready to go to bed, just take it, don't skip it. Take your pill, don't not take your pill. So yeah. I'd, I'd rather see, I'd rather probably see, so Pixaban's the one you take twice a day, Riva you take once a day after 21 days. So I'd rather see people um, 
you know, if they shortened it up a little bit, I realize you don't want to be over anticoagulated, but I think that that's, that's just not that big of a problem with apixaban. Yeah, yeah. We had a comment that the empathy circle graphic was on point speaking from a PE patient. So the person who, uh, who wrote that in, thank you. I completely agree that that was really uh, very helpful uh, for people to see. Uh, there were a few specific questions people had on the CLUE study. I think one was, um, were people having B PE or DVT or both? And, and we had about, I think it was about 36% had PE, 21% had DVT, and 42% had both. And then just to let you know, because there's been a lot of questions about anticoagulation, 80% of the people that took the survey are still on anticoagulation. And so it's going to be very helpful for us to kind of, again, look at all those different components and all those different quantitative surveys um, and see um, and see how they, um, uh, we'll see what we're going to learn from that. Um, Dr. Khan, I had another question. You were talking about how important it is to listen and hear and understand your patients. You know, in a busy ER where you're probably seeing, I don't know how many hundreds of patients in your shift, how do you do that? I mean, you're getting pulled in so many different directions, people. How do you actually stop what you're doing and able to do that? Well, one thing we did learn from asking lots of different patients is not everybody's the same. Um, folks that are older, they, they want to be called Mr. or Mrs. usually. And folks that are younger, they, they appreciate if you ask what they like to be called. So some of these details are just the initial, you know, what do I call you? And the other part is that I'm I'm going to be with you until midnight. I'm here till then. I'm Dr. Klein. I'll even point. I'll say I'm, I'll be in that room right there where the doctors are if you want me. The the more that I allow them to have access to me, the less they access me. If I try <laughs> to pretend like I'm, you know, I'm going to disappear and never see you again, I think that makes people anxious. And the next thing they do is start hitting their call bell. So mm -hmm. it's about saying, I'm here, I am present, I'm going to take care of you. And you can yeah. do that in one minute. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And um, what would you tell patients when they're maybe having a provider they're interacting with that's not you and isn't doing that? What kind of strategies could they have that could help them? I... I think that this can backfire very quickly um, for patients, but um, I'm going to go ahead and say it. And I, I think you <laughs> sometimes have to say, I, I don't think you're hearing me, doctor. And, um, you, you know, just be respectful, but I don't, I don't think you're hearing my main point. And I think to some extent, allow for the possibility that you, maybe I need to restate this for you, doctor. But uh, advocate for yourself because no one else is going to when you're in that situation where you have a doc, you know, doctors aren't perfect, perfect. They, they can have other things going on that make them less empathic on some days than others. Um, make them listen to you. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. And, and I don't think you have to do it in a, um, an accusatory way or mean way, but just, you know, just keep honing in uh, of what you're saying. For example, the case that I presented, you know, that poor it's, I think that's a lot of times where the misdiagnosis comes to is because Patients are just not being listened to. And again, a busy ER, a busy ward, a busy, you know, wherever that is. Um, we do know from data that a lot of PEs are missed. So um, really advocate for yourself. And, and for the 21% who are patients on this call and webinar um, and family members, advocate for a family member. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's most important. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I do want to, we've gotten a lot of comments um, in the question just about how people are so thankful for having this um, and uh, feeling really um, uh, help, that this has been incredibly uh, helpful. Uh, again, this is going to be available. So if you want to watch it with a family member or a patient, or you want to uh, share this with your colleagues, um, you will be able to get this um, uh, um, on the website. Um, Dr. Klein, before we end, what is your take home message? You know, what's the last thing you want to end, uh, say to people that you want to end with? What's kind of your final take home point? I think it varies for, for physicians versus patients, but I would say that the most important thing that I could say to save lives would be to clinicians 
to think about that phrase, what brought you here today? And it sounds simple, you learned it in med school, but sometimes we need to relearn it. What was going through your head when you decided to come here today? And that way we can get the right diagnostic modality and underway and save lives. Yeah, thank you. That is very well said. And and I, I, my, I guess my take home would be, this is such an important topic and it's really wonderful that the CDC is recognizing the importance of this and inviting us to come and present on it. So thank you to the CDC and the National Blood Clot Alliance and World Thrombosis Day and PERT. And we just have all these wonderful organizations. Um, this is the last slide. Um, I, I, again, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today. We appreciate the invitation from our colleagues at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders to present today. And we also thank our colleagues from the National Blood Cut Alliance for hosting today's webinar. Very shortly, you're gonna receive an email asking for your feedback. So please respond with your comments. We wanna learn from you what, what you liked about it, what you didn't, what we could do differently, what other um, webinars that you'd like to hear from. And if you have additional questions about today's presentation, I want you to contact Cynthia Sayers and you can see her email um, address right there. And I just wanna say Cynthia has been doing this, I, I think for maybe 20 years now and has just been so passionate about this webinar series and really bringing these types of topics to the forefront, these really important topics. So it's been just an honor and privilege uh, to work with you, uh, Cynthia, and thank you for all you have done. Today's webinar, like I said, a few times will be archived uh, and the content will be soon available at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders website as shown on this slide, so you can go there. And whoever remarked that this would be a good thing to do for World Thrombosis Day, absolutely encourage you to celebrate that day. And this sharing this webinar uh, is definitely it would be a, a good, a wonderful way to do that. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>